Emmanuel. Good morning. We are so glad you're joining us for worship today. Our worship focus for today is all about the finished work of Jesus on the cross. Colossians 2 teaches us that when Jesus died, he disarmed the evil powers and authorities and shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. So we get to gather today to worship Jesus for the salvation he he had for the salvation we have in Jesus. Amen. Amen. So please turn your eyes to the screen for our call to worship. It says, I will exalt you, my God the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. Come on, let's give him a praise with our hands this morning. God, we fix our eyes on you this morning. And you offer, we offer our praise to you, God. of us today, Lord. Praise be a weapon that silences the enemy. And praise be a weapon that conquers all anxiety. So let it rise. Let praise arise. Oh, for 
thank you that we get to remember who you are, Father God, that you are a way maker, that you're a way through the darkness, you're a way out of the darkness, God. Thank you for this holy moment that we get to look up, Father God, and not look at ourselves, but look up right now, Lord God, at who you are, who you say you are. Church, Proverbs 28 says, whoever conceals their sins does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. So take this time to silently confess before your Father. this word of assurance from first Peter it says praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ in his great mercy he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish spoil or fade this inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Can we offer up a praise to our Father this morning? God, our hope is in you, our trust is in you. You're our living hope and we put our faith in you this morning.
believe in the story of Jesus. We believe in this testimony, Lord. We just thank you right now for this time, Lord. And we ask that you just continue to go before us. Help us to hear your word, to receive your word, and to be doers of your word. In the mighty name of Jesus, we said, amen. Please remain standing as we read the word together. From Exodus, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron will be your prophet. You are to say everything I command you, and your brother Aaron is to tell Pharaoh to let the Israelites go out of his country. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and though I multiply my signs and wonders in Egypt, he will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt and with mighty acts of judgment, I will bring out my divisions, my people, the Israelites. And the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring the Israelites out of it. Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord commanded them. Moses was 88, was 80 years old and Aaron 83 when they spoke to Pharaoh. This is the word of the Lord. You can be seated. church. And welcome. My name is Clark. If I haven't met you yet, I'm the teaching pastor here. And today we get the pleasure of studying God's word out of the book of Exodus. Um, today we're looking at a, a large portion of scripture. It's actually Exodus 7 through uh, Exodus 11. This is what we know as the plagues of Egypt. Uh, sometimes people debate as to like, why did this happen? And why did it take 10 plagues? And what's behind it? And there's a lot of mystery to this. And um, we're going to unpack it today. When you go back to Exodus 5, verse 2, Pharaoh posed a question, and this is what he said. He said, who is this Lord, Yahweh, that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know this Yahweh, and moreover, I will not let Israel go. And so chapter 7 through 11 is Yahweh responding to Pharaoh going, now I will show you who the one true God is. And so the title of the sermon is God versus lowercase g, gods. We talked about the word Elohim and Yahweh and Adonai a few weeks ago. When you read the Bible, you'll notice that there are other spiritual beings. Uh, I would also liken them to demons. I think when I look at what's happening in Egypt and uh, the pantheon that Egyptian worshipped, we're going to look at that too, it's in your notes, uh, these are demonic beings that God has come to uh, show that he is over and above. So look at Exodus 12, verse 12. At the end of this verse, it says, On all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am Yahweh. I am the Lord. If you go to Numbers 33, this is a couple books later. Uh, Moses is looking back and they're recapping the story of God and everything that had happened when they had left Egypt. And this is what he says. He says, On their gods... The Lord executed his judgments. And so if you could enter this story with me. Before you get to the plagues, uh, Moses and Aaron are standing before Pharaoh, and they uh, use one of the signs that God had given them to, to perform. 
and they have the staff and they throw it down and that staff turns into the serpent, the snake. And they, uh, Moses, uh, Pharaoh's Egyptians, they try to counter and they throw their staffs do and with some kind of occultic practices, they're able to do this. Uh, they seem to have some kind of spiritual ability, but it's limited, nothing like creator God, only he can create. But they are able to mimic this. But if you pay close attention to the scripture, Aaron and Moses' snake eats their snakes. And here's another background piece of information. Everybody thinks Moses is the author or had great influence on, on the writing of the Torah. So Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Every commentator I read says when you read this passage, you as a listener should go back to the creation account. As I said last week, what's on Pharaoh's headdress? It's a serpent. Have you seen any kind of cartoon of a pharaoh or a drawing or ancient historic depiction? There's a serpent because they said he is to be like God. The pharaoh was a deity, and that serpent held that image and that authority for the Egyptian culture. So when Moses and Aaron show up and they drop their staff, turns into a serpent, their serpent defeats their serpent. They're going, oh, do you remember what God said in Genesis 3.15? After Adam and Eve sinned, God put a, a word forth that said one day the Messiah is going to come from the seed of woman. And he is going to do what? Crush the head of who? The serpent. And so behind Egypt, it's not, it's not Moses versus Pharaoh. It's not even Pharaoh versus Yahweh. It's the kingdom of God versus the kingdom of this world. It's the kingdom of light invading the kingdom of darkness. And God, Yahweh, the one true Lord, is essentially letting everybody know right out of the get-go, I am the one true God. All you other lowercase g gods, you're going down. I have come to save my people. Now, then from out the plagues, you go through the Nile River, then the lice and the flies and the cattle, the boils, the hail, the locusts, three days of darkness, death of the firstborn. I want you to put your spiritual lenses on and go, this is not just about weird bugs crawling around everywhere. This is not just about cattle. This is a spirit war. There was a spirit war then. There's a spirit war right now. And so the Bible is trying to communicate this to us often. Now, if you think back to Exodus 1, what happened? Pharaoh put an edict out to kill all the babies in Egypt. Shephra and Pua, these servants, are used by God to redeem and save these little ones. It's amazing. Uh, but behind that, then, Pharaoh goes, okay, take the rest of the babies and throw them into the Nile. So on one hand, the Bible says, and it's true, Pharaoh looked and saw Israel is multiplying. They are getting large. And so Pharaoh is saying, I got to kill them. But behind that, I want you to put your spirit lenses on in the context of the greater story of the Bible. Why would Satan want to take the life, and especially the life of the baby boys in Egypt? When you go back to Genesis 3, you know that the messianic line is going to come from this group of people. One day, the snake crusher is going to come from this group of people. So if you're the evil one, you're going to do everything you can to eradicate this threat that's going to come against your, your kingdom. Now, this is not only an Old Testament teaching. You go to the beginning of the Gospels. Every Christmas, we'll often read, you know, Matthew 1, Matthew 2, Matthew 3. There was this guy named Herod. Everybody remember Herod? Jesus is born. What edict does he put forth when the wise men don't return? Kill all the baby boys in Bethlehem. Why? Well, fair, on, on the surface level, Herod is threatened, his throne is threatened. But behind that is Satan going, the Messiah is going to come through this line. i got to do everything I can to eradicate this threat. Now you go to the very end of the Bible, Revelation 12. We're going to preach on Revelation for months next year. I cannot wait. It's a timely word for the church on God's faithfulness to his church today. But when you go to Revelation 12, there's this odd story of a dragon trying to eat a pregnant woman and her baby. You know what John's trying to get you to see? Behind the veil, behind the story of the scripture, is the evil one trying to crush the Messiah in the messianic line. And God's saying it's not going to happen because I am the one true God. I am Yahweh, and I will show the world what I'm about to do. And now you enter the story of the plagues with all that in mind. Isn't this amazing? God is going to show everyone that he is the one true God. Now, I want to focus on this character, Pharaoh, for a second. Anytime you look at Pharaoh in the scripture, you'll notice his heart is being talked about. There are so many articles and books that debate Pharaoh's heart and his heart being hardened. 
And, and on one level, you watch this guy progressively just get darker and darker and darker. There are moments he seems to repent, but he doesn't really. We'll talk about that in a minute. He gets more calloused, and eventually God says, I'm going to raise this man up, as God foretold, to use him for my purposes. But when we give our hearts to the things of this world, when we give our hearts to things that are not of God, our hearts become calloused as well. We become desensitized to the things of God. When you go back to Exodus 3, verse 19, God says, I am fully aware of what's happening and what's about to happen. If you look at verse 19 in chapter 3, it says, I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. Right there, we're told that it's possible that at some point Pharaoh might let the people go. And then after this, you're going to notice verse after verse, God hardening Pharaoh's heart. A man who has committed, uh, committed inventicide, murder, genocide, race-based slavery. Eventually God says enough is enough. But when you look at the, the plagues here, and if you have your notes, would you open up your notes for me real quick? I put the, this really cool chart in there for you if you want a Bible nerd with me. You'll notice that Pharaoh's stubbornness throughout the, the plagues, the first five plagues in the Hebrew, the hardening of his heart is neutral, or he does it to himself, meaning God is not hardening his heart. If you look at the first one with the, the Nile River to blood, it says Pharaoh's heart became hard. And if you look at chapter 8, the frog invasion, Pharaoh hardened his own heart. And then you go to the gnats or the lice, Pharaoh's heart was hard. Then you go to the swarming flies, Pharaoh hardened his own heart. And then you go to the pestilence on the cattle. Pharaoh's heart was hard. And so it's not until the second half of the plagues that the Bible goes out of its way for God to live into the word that he foretold, saying, I will harden his heart because God does. Because God does. And so there are going to be people that want to fight about it. Do not email me. I will not respond. I am not going to fight you on this. I am telling you the Bible lives in this tension of a sovereign God who is ordaining and working and electing and moving in ways that are above my head. And the Bible is clear, which is why Moses wrote this the way he did, that Pharaoh is not a victim. Pharaoh is not some victim that God just picked on. and was like, oh, I'm going to make this guy's life hell. It's a both and. It's a both and. When you look at what happens, though, every time you give your heart to the things of this world, there is a callousing and there is a desensitization that happens. There's a couple that I care about a lot, and I'm watching what they're, the, the decisions that they're making right now. If you go back a little bit, there's this family, you don't know them. Um, they had a really, really good family network in place in their life. They had a system where they could rely on extended family and aunts and uncles. They were raising their family within family. It was a really good thing. They were connected to a church. They had a church community that is a, should be a high value, right? A high value. And then in, in addition to that, they were really good citizens within their community. It was very helpful. What happened was a couple years ago, the husband decided that he wanted to work overtime on July 4th. And on July 4th, uh, you get overtime, you get paid double. Now, just to be clear, this is overtime they did not need. This is money they did not need. So what happened was that pulled him away from the family function that they had had for years. And he got his paycheck, and he's like, yo, this is, this is twice as big. This isn't too bad. Well, then at Thanksgiving, I'm going to work. I want that, that check. That two twice as big. That was really nice. He starts working on holidays. And after a couple of years, what you'll notice is these small decisions to get a money that they didn't need pulled them from not only family functions, but also church and also allow, uh, did not allow him to be as active in participating in the community as they once were. Now you fast forward to where we're at today. This couple's at a tough spot right now because the husband has decided that he wants to move the family across the country to a place where they know nobody. They know no churches because he wants money they do not need. There's a good chance they're going to go. So as I just sit back and watch, you just see all these little decisions. I would say a callousing of the heart, a desensitization of the heart, of small decisions, little ones, over time that uprooted values that were once important to them, and now he is truly indifferent to the Lord and the calling on their family and the community. Three things I would say are very, very important, all for the sake of money. 
Now, what happens when we give our hearts to the things of this world and things that are not of God, our heart hardens and life unravels as God has designed it to be lived. Uh, when you go back to the book of Exodus, the very beginning, I said this week one, it begins in the Hebrew with the word and. And the reason why it begins with the word and is because Moses wants us to know that this is a continuation of what you and I read in Genesis. This is a continuation of that story. And so Moses is using clear language in, in the Exodus account with the plagues that should bring us back to Genesis 1 and 2 and 3. And the point he makes in the plagues is that when you give your life to things that are not of God and sin sets in, life as God has designed it to be lived will unravel. I want to show you. Don't take my word for it. In uh, chapter 7, verses 14 through 15, 25, I mean, there's this God, Happy. Happy was the God or goddess of the Nile. Uh, the Nile was everything for Egypt. When the Nile flooded, the when you read the, this account in Hebrew, it talks about how the water pooled. The bloody water in the Nile pooled. And it's the exact same language used in Genesis 1 when God talks about how he pooled the waters. God is saying here, Pharaoh, I have known what you have done to the boys in this river. I know what you have done. And creation is going to begin to unravel because what you are doing is evil and wicked and vile. And God is stepping in. He's essentially letting them know, I know what you've done. I'm coming for my people and I'm coming for you because I am the one true God. When you go to the second plague, and we're not going to go through all of them, in chapter 8, it's frogs. If you look at this picture, uh, this is the goddess Heket from the Egyptian pantheon. This is in the notes. You can look at later. Heket was in charge of population control. It was the fertility goddess. It's basically the birth control god or goddess. Like everything, if you wanted to have a family, you would have made a sacrifice in Egypt unto this frog god or goddess. I would say a demon. Right? So when you read Exodus 8, 3, the plague is coming, and it says the Nile is going to what with frogs? Team. If you're reading that and you understand the story of God, that word team shows up where? In the creation account. Look at Genesis 1, 20. God said, let the water team with living creatures. Let the birds fly above the earth, across the vault, in the sky. And so what God is doing right now is he's beginning to bring judgment on the plagues. And he's saying, this is how life was designed to be lived. And you are in sin, Pharaoh. And this thing you got going on in Egypt is wicked and vile. I'm going to unravel it and undo all the good that I have done. That's what he's getting at. And so lines are blurred. Because when God creates, he makes clear distinctions, right? There is the day and there is the night. There is the sun and there is the moon. There is the water and there is the land. Well, let me ask you this question. What kind of animal is a frog? Amphibious, yes. Science teacher, let's go. Amphibious creature, which means it, it blurs the line. It's, it's a water creature, but it's also a land creature. And so when you read Exodus, all of a sudden, all these frogs, millions of frogs, they're in your kitchen, they're in your kettle, they're in your bed, they're in your toilet, they're in your clothes, they're in your sock drawer, they're in your, you name it, the frogs are there. God is blurring the lines of what he had once made distinct. Then when you're in sin, creation will unravel. And it's going to be a huge mess. And now when I look at our cultural moment, the same is true for us today. When we live in sin, lines get blurred. If you could go back 10 years ago, I don't think anybody would have thought we would have to be having the conversations with our kids that we are today. And I mean, like, when I walk out in public with my kids, often my kids ask me, is that a man or a woman? Ten years ago when Kirby was born, if you told me that this was coming, I'd have been like, maybe in like 40 years? I don't know. But here we are. And I'm not angry. I'm not shouting. But this is a reality for my family now. I'm going, how did the lines get blurred now? We can't tell the difference. I listened to a politician recently do an interview in which they wish to decriminalize prostitution. This is a very public figure. You know this person. It's to decriminalize prostitution because they're consenting adults. I'm like... How are the lines getting blurred? And it's, it's small decision after small decision after small decision after small decision that gets there. And you're like, don't you care about women's rights? 
Don't you care about what this does to people? Not only that, human trafficking, the little people that get pulled into this immoral industry that people look at on their computer like this is evil, it's vile, it's wicked. So as I tell you, behind Pharaoh, behind Egypt, behind war, behind political policies, behind all these movements in our cultural moment, there's a spirit war that's happening. I'm just saying as a Christian, be informed and read the word of God. Ask God to give you eyes to see. But the problem is not only out there. The problem also needs to be addressed right here. Can I get an amen? Because when we live in sin, when I live in sin, lines can get blurred as well. A couple of questions I ask myself and I'd invite you to ask yourself. At what point did I become okay listening to music that exploits other people and encourages violence? Like, what am I listening to on Spotify or iTunes? And is this helpful or not? Is this godly or not? At what point did I become okay with shows that have the language they have and the intimate scenes they have? It's a slow movement of decision after decision after decision. In a world of social media, at what point did I think it's okay to post the pictures of myself that I am posting? What's amazing about this one is you can actually go back to your feed and just look at what you posted a couple years ago compared to what you're posting today. A lot of folks, especially my generation and younger, are posting more and more revealing pictures. That's one decision after one decision after one decision. At what point did one drink become five? Lines are blurred when we live in sin. But God is a God of life, and he's a God of light, and he is a God of order. And he calls us to himself. And when we live in sin, creation unravels. Now, there are these other characters in this story, and it's the magicians. We don't have a lot of time to unpack the magicians that work unto Pharaoh. The first couple plagues, they're able to keep up, and they you know, change the staff into snakes. They appear to change water to blood, but they can't change it back. And in fact, they have to dig a ditch on the side of the Nile and drink mud water, so I would not consider that a victory. But a point comes where they are not able to do what God's doing any longer. If you look at verses 18 and 19 of chapter 8, it says, When the magicians tried to produce gnats by their secret arts, they could not. Since the gnats were on people and animals everywhere, and the magicians said to Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. This is the finger of Yahweh. But Pharaoh's heart was hard, and he would not listen, just as the Lord had said. So church, Satan cannot create life. He only takes the good stuff that God makes, and he tries to pervert it and manipulate it, and use it against us. So when we think about our world right now and the idols of our world, we don't have um, 114 gods or goddesses in this pantheon that we like, actively think about, but we do worship the gods and the idols of power and of wealth and of pleasure and of comfort and of all these things. And when we do that, the lines are blurred in life as God has designed it unravels and it's a small decision after small decision after small decision nobody wakes up and goes ha huh, today i'm going to become a murderer or you know what? i'm going to i'm going to go commit adultery today i'm going to go steal and rob something from a bank i'm going to do that like if you can backtrack in people's thought processes it wasn't just one day they just decided like i'm going to go do this terrible thing it's small decisions it's little compromises on top of each other and we think, hey, if I give myself to this, it's like marketing, it's advertising. You have a problem and you have this need, but if you buy what the world's selling, you're going to be satisfied and you're going to get the boyfriend and girlfriend of your dreams. You're going to get that promotion, the car, the status, that beach body, whatever it is, you buy the supplement, you're going to be looking ready to go in 25. Buy this. And we, we give ourselves to this, hoping that that's going to satisfy the longings of our heart. And, the, and magicians tap into this here. They're going, we can't keep up with Yahweh. We can't do what this God's doing. He, he is the one true God. He alone is in charge. And that, that's, my, that's my heart for us today is that we'd understand that there comes a point where we all need to truly repent. And when you look at the passage as it continues, uh, Pharaoh is a great example of what not to do. <laughs> because he, at a couple times, goes, will you pray to your God for me? Will you plead to the Lord for me? A couple times he even says, I've sinned. But he never actually turns back and walks away from his sin towards the Lord. Look what it says in verse 8 of chapter 8. Pharaoh calls Moses when the plagues are coming. Plead with the Lord to take away the frogs from me and from my people. And I will let the people go sacrifice to the Lord. And after there's relief, look at what verse 15 says. When Pharaoh said, saw that there was relief, he hardened his own heart. 
and he would not listen to Moses and Aaron just as the Lord had said. You know, there's this huge difference, church, from just saying, I'm sorry, to kind of get through a situation and truly repenting. Repentance, I'm learning, is one of the most beautiful gifts God has given us. But when we just say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, just to get through the situation and try to get to the other side of it, whether you're fighting with your spouse or a coworker or whatever, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Sorry is not true repentance. True repentance is stopping, is turning around, and it's actively walking towards the Lord. The Bible talks about a renewal of your mind and a renewal of your life that God has called us to. And it begins with just little decisions. It's a lot of little decisions. I haven't calculated, I haven't looked up the stats on how many decisions you make in a day, but I'm guessing it's, it's hundreds, if not thousands, of little decisions you're constantly making, right? I was talking to a friend of mine recently, and uh, this guy's life has just changed over the last couple years. And I asked him, like, hey, how did you go from that three years ago to the guy you are today? And he had the most profound answer. You know what he said to me? He said, I started to go into bed on time. I was like, explain yourself right now. Like, what are you talking about? He's like, well, you see, I used to stay up and party on the weekends. But then I would go to bed on time, and I'd wake up the next day, and I would have energy to eat healthy and work out. And I started losing all this weight. I'm like, well, just as a, a human being, that's good. He's like, but what else happened was when I wouldn't go out and party on Saturday nights, I'd decide I'm going to go to bed on time. I'd wake up and work out, and then I would be at church because I decided the night before I'm going to go to bed on time. And then that steamrolled throughout my week where I would go to bed on time and then I'd wake up and not only would I work out, I would have time to have intimate, quiet time with the Lord because I went to bed on time. And then this starts to affect his friendships and his relationships and who he's hanging out with and who he's not. And, and the Lord used this to change his body, to change his mind, but ultimately and most importantly to change his, his heart. He's becoming a new man. So when we ask you this year, who are you becoming? This one little decision, I'm just going to go to bed on time, has allowed his life to transform in a beautiful way by God's grace. So what, when it comes to real repentance here, God's looking down. He's fully aware of what's happening in Egypt. He's fully aware of what's happening with Pharaoh. He's fully aware. He's saying, plead with me, pray for me. But Pharaoh's not really repenting. And you go back to 7, verse 5. This is what God says. The Egyptians will know that I am Yahweh. Because I will stretch out my hand against Egypt and I will bring the Israelites out of it. Now when you read the text, when I write my sermons, I always sit with a pen and paper in the Bible. I don't go to commentaries. I don't go to podcasts. I don't listen to anyone else's sermon. I'm just like, God, what are you saying here? And one of the words that popped off the page at me what was this. Look at the screen. It was, it was Goshen. I don't know why, but I was like, what, what's up with this place? And I know this is like where God's people lived. And when you read the text, it talks about how God's people were there. And then multiple times, God says that he is not going to allow his people to be affected by the plagues there. The flies and gnats can't get them. The cattle that belong to the Israelites are not going to be harmed. And when you look at the meaning of Goshen, Goshen means to draw near. I'm like, wow, this is amazing. God, the whole story of God is God drawing near to humanity. God leaving the thrones of heaven to come to the manger. God leaving the heavenly realm to put on flesh. It's God coming to you. That, that again is what sets Christianity apart from everybody else. It's not so much what we have done, but it's us responding to what Christ has done. And then when I read this, I'm like, ah, oh, Goshen, drawing near. I look at the passages and look at verse 23. God said, I'm going to make a distinction between my people and your people, Pharaoh. And as I thought about Pharaoh and repentance and really not repentance and what repentance looked like, it's like one of the marks of a true Christian today is repentance. Is true, real, genuine, authentic repentance. Not just saying I'm sorry, but saying, God, I've done wrong and I'm going to go to you. And so this word, Goshen, the word for draw near, is used in the New Testament when it's translated to Greek. And it comes in James 4.8. I want you to read this with me. James says, Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Or depending on your translation, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Why? What are you supposed to do? It models out repentance for us. It says, wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. 
And so when I think about the gospel, and I think about Jesus, and I think about what God's doing, I celebrate God, thank you. Why, we were dead in sin, you drew near to us, and you call us to draw near to you. Like, thank you. And I think about the two stories. On one hand, one man is going for overtime that he doesn't need, and he values money more than community, family, and the church, and all these little decisions, he is not drawing near to the Lord. I can put my money on it. When hard times come, he's going to cry out to God and go, I'm sorry. And then there's going to be a period of relief and go back to what I was doing. And yet my other friend seems to be captivated by God's love. And the Holy Spirit seems to be mysteriously working in his heart. And it all begins with this little decision. I'm going to go to bed on time. And God's using this to change this man, and not only change them, this man, but change everybody else around him. So right now, church, if you find yourself in a rut, I'm begging you, Go to the Lord and pray. Ask the Holy Spirit to soften your heart. Pray that God would reveal to you the sin that you're unaware of. It's a dangerous and beautiful prayer that God will answer. Like, God, will you show me my blind spots? Show me where I am erroneous. Show me where I have missed it. Show me where I can be a better pastor, a husband, father. Because there are spots that I am, I'm not aware of, and, I'm, and I know that. Would you show me? And maybe you're at a, a point today, and this is a message for a lot of folks, is, but pastor, I don't even care. Like, I'm just numb. I'm lukewarm. And I want you to pray this prayer. Help me to care, God. That's it. Can you pray that prayer? Help me to care, God. Just say, God, help me to want to change because I don't want to change. Help me. And I believe that God will. And for the rest of us, I would encourage you, pray God's word back to him. So as I sat in the text this week, this, this draw near, this Goshen was like, wow. I for, James 4, 8, that was not on the front of my mind, but God gives it to me in his word. Like, this is amazing. God's saying, draw near to me. I'm drawing near to you. It's like, this is incredible. It reminded me of John 14, when Jesus said, the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the heavenly Father has sent in his name, he will teach you all things, and he will also do what? He will remind you of all things. Pray this passage. Oh, God, will you remind me of the things that I've forgotten? Would you move me to real repentance? Thank you, Lord. And then John 15, we pray this prayer. Like, God, you're the vine, I'm the branch. If I remain in you, I'll be able to bear much fruit because it's Christ in you, it's the Spirit in you. And apart from you, I can do nothing. Like, pray these prayers. God, help me to help, to want to change, if you need to pray that prayer. But model real repentance where we leave the things of this world, we go to bed on time, if that's what it takes, and you walk towards the Lord. Now, this is probably my favorite part of the passage, and this is where you get to Jesus and these plagues. It's going to just get amped up the next couple weeks when you get to the darkness and the death of the firstborn and Passover. But Christ is in this plagues. When you read the, the story, darkness now sets over the land of Egypt in chapter 10 for three days. Like no light whatsoever, just pitch black darkness. Can you imagine that? Pitch black darkness. And God is reimposing darkness on evil because he's, he's unraveling creation. Because at the beginning, the first thing God said is, let there be. And now he says, let there be darkness. Judgment on you, Pharaoh, because of what you've done to my people. And when you and I reject God as creator, we become unmade. This is not the only time darkness came down on the earth. Look at what it says in Luke 23, verse 44. It was about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three after the noon. Who did that come down on? Who? Jesus. Look at this quote from this theologian I really respect. The ninth plague was not the last time darkness came as a sign and a means of judgment. Another day dawned and then darkened unnaturally as a man hung dying on a cross, while from noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over the land. The three days of darkness over Egypt was mirrored by the three hours of darkness over Jesus, followed by his death. At the cross, the plagues fell on Jesus, the Son of God. At the cross, the Maker became unmade so that we could be remade. The Son was unraveled under the judgment of the Father. He experienced chaos, darkness, and death. And as Jesus died, the rocks split. The earth shook, and it was ultimate moment of uncreation. Yet as the rocks split, the tombs broke open, and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. In that moment, recreation erupted as the dead came back to life. It was the anticipation of recreation of Jesus at the resurrection. 
And at the resurrection of Jesus is the promise in the beginning of all recreation. It's the promise of our recreation. Isn't that amazing? Jesus Christ right in the middle of the plagues. And worship team, you guys can come on up. I, I just, that gives you so much hope. Because the truth is, we've all given ourselves to sin. There have been lines that have been blurred in every single one of our hearts. And yet the Bible is saying it doesn't matter what you've done. We preached on Romans. Romans 8 talks about nothing can separate you from God's love. It doesn't matter what you've said. It doesn't matter what's been said to you. It doesn't matter what you've done or what, what's been done to you or what will happen. It's like if you're in Christ, he's not going to lose you. And when you see the plagues and the darkness come on Jesus and then the dead people come back to life, can you imagine? I'm just trying to immerse myself in that story. How wild would that have been for you to be sitting there and all of a sudden your grandpa comes walking down the street? Like, what? And that's a picture of your heart. That's a picture of the spirit. That's a picture of what God does when you repent and you believe in him and you get back at God's heart. God making this, this public display of evil. So in the plagues, God's going, yeah, the Nile goddess, uh, you're down here. I got you. Yep. And then the gnats and the lice and the cattle and then the darkness. God's like, this God, this God, this God, this God, this God is in the pantheon. You are little. You are demonic. You are, you are beaten. I will make a public spectacle of you. So then when Jesus goes to the cross and the darkness comes on him and he dies and pays the price that you and I were owed, life comes out of it. And so that's what we get from Colossians. This was in the liturgy earlier. Having disarmed the powers and the authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. It's like Jesus has done everything. And the story of Exodus is pointing to a greater Exodus that's ours in Christ. When he brings us from sin into this new life and freedom and liberation that he wants you to experience. But it requires genuine and authentic repentance. And I want you to sense God's heart behind this. One person asked, why nine plagues? Why ten plagues? Why didn't God just, like, come in and take care of it and get everybody out? Well, he gives people a chance to repent. That's why. He's really gracious. He's incredibly merciful. And as evil and wicked as Pharaoh was, I thank God that he doesn't come to me and just, there you go, Clark. You got it. You deserved it. It's like, thank you, God, for not doing that to me. Oh, He's so gracious. So later on when we preach Exodus, what you're going to find out is not only does Israel leave, but Egyptians, it's implied that Egyptians come with them. And then there's other foreigners that come with Israel. And then there's eunuchs. So then when you come to the time of the covenant, God says they can be part of my family as well if they will obey and be part of my covenant people. And this is what Ezekiel 33 says. God's speaking to his people, which is a whole group of folks now. It says, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they would turn away from their ways and that they would live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, O people of Israel? So as you think about the plagues in Moses, I want you to think about Jesus. I want you to think about what happened to him on that cross. I want you to think about what real repentance looks like. I want you to think about drawing near because he first has come and drawn near to you you look at the screen, here are the questions I'd like to give you today. Ask God to show you the ways that your heart has become desensitized to God's word and way. One of the many ways people are distinct from the world is the recognition that God has first drawn near to us. How is God calling you to draw near to him? Would you take just a minute and ponder these things?
Thank you for the price you paid, bearing all my sin and shame. In love you came and gave amazing grace. Thank you for this love.
Lord, you can be seated. As we continue in our service, we get to give our tithes and our offerings. Exodus says, from what you have, take an offering for the Lord. Everyone who is willing is to bring to the Lord an offering. So if you're willing, you can give as the basket passes your row, or you can give online. Please give us your lead this morning.
After service, you're invited forward to, to you're invited forward to come and receive prayer from our prayer ministers. They'll be up front of the stage, or you can submit a prayer request anytime throughout the app throughout the, throughout the week. Thank you, Naisha. On the front of your bulletin, it shares what's happening Saturday. We're we're ready to equip you. Why should I believe in the Christian faith? How do I explain my reform background? Uh, how do I talk to a Mormon lovingly? How do I share the faith with a Jehovah Witness? How do I get my children in the faith? Saturday, 10 to 12, 20 minute blocks. We hope you join us. Would you open your hands? Lord, would you bless now your church? We thank you, Lord, that you are God over all and you're the deliverer. We thank you for the deliverance of the Israelites in the Old Testament, for our deliverance in Jesus Christ. We bless you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the powerful support of fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. Let's give praise. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here be. Yeah.